So here we are, week four of Elijah all in. And so I want to recap just a little bit because when we think about Elijah, we think we, we read through the Bible, and we're all guilty of this, myself included. So we, the Bible is filled with some incredible, phenomenal stories of faith and the demonstrations of those faith and what God does through people and characters of the Bible. It astounds us. It amazes us. We stand in awe of God's power and his ability, and that's no different with the character of Elijah. And it's like, oh, my gosh, look at how incredible Elijah is. Elijah shows up to King Ahab pronounces a drought and a famine over a nation of people, stands before a king. And when we read these stories, we read them and we're astounded by God's power and his goodness, but it's really, really hard, if we're honest, it's really, really hard for sometimes to read these stories and really relate to some of these Bible characters in a very real, personable way normal way because I can guarantee you maybe I'm astounded but none of you have ever stood in front of a king and have pronounced a judgment over their sin and a drought over their nation anybody ever done that that's what I thought so you've never done that so that's not normal in your life how many of you have ever taken a, a young boy and laid him on a bed and prayed over him and God restored his life after he was already dead. Yeah, exactly. I've never done that. You've never done that. So how, do I, how does that become personable in my life? How do I relate to that on a personal level? I've never done things like that. That's something that God would never do through me. How many of you have ever stood on the top of a mountain at a showdown with people who worship other gods and you challenge them to a feat that says whoever can pray fire, literal fire, out of heaven to burn up your altar, then will prove who the real God is. How many of you have ever prayed this literal column of fire out of heaven? Exactly. None of us. And we read these stories, and we're like, you know, those are incredible stories, and those teach me a lesson about how incredible our God is, but I've never done those things. And so they're great stories, but I don't really get how I can relate to Elijah, because Elijah's not normal. But I guarantee you Elijah's normal, okay? And so I think one of the, the things that we have to do in reading the Word is we have to look beyond those incredible feats of faith and find the normalcy in that Bible character and that person so that we can relate to them. And that's kind of what I want to do. I want to go back and take us a little bit through each of these events in, in order that we've talked about them so far and to make sure you're not missing how you relate to Elijah because he's extremely normal. And so here, let's look at this. So how is Elijah just like you? So here's one. Elijah was a very faithful, very obedient, committed follower of God. He knew God's word. He knew God's word. And the one thing about Elijah is he absolutely despised the fact that there were people who would call themselves the audacity of calling themselves a follower of God and then deliberately go against God's word. So in Elijah's life, he's like, how could you sit there and call yourself a follower of God and know what you're doing is a sin and you don't care and you keep doing it and you don't want to change? How can you call yourself a follower of God by doing that? Elijah didn't like that. And some of you, are very faithful, obedient followers of God who are committed to his word, and you're an Elijah. You were like Elijah. You don't like that either. But on the other hand, you got Ahab, who called himself a follower of God, who knew he was disobeying God, who knew what he was doing was a sin, and he didn't care. And he didn't want to change. So you know what that means? It means this morning in here, we got some Ahabs. We got some people who are very proud voicers. That I'm, I'm a follower of God. I know I'm living in sin. 
I know what I'm doing is a sin, and you know what? I don't care. And you better not call it out in my life, because if you do, I'm going to get mad at you and blame you for all my problems. You've been there too, right? So here's Elijah. He's got an Ahab, and he knows he's living wrong. And God has told him, Elijah, I need you to go talk to Ahab. And I need you to tell him and call out his sin and tell him how he's living is wrong. And you know what Elijah did? He said, okay. It's not going to be easy, but I will. Many of you have been Elijah. That's the normal part. Many of you have a friend, have a family member, a husband, a wife, a child, a co-worker. And you see them, and they voice themselves as a follower of God all the time, but you see them deliberately sinning, and they don't care. And you feel this urge on your heart to call them out. Not to be mean, but to bring their sin out in the open and say, Listen, you say you're a Christian, but this is what you're doing, and that's wrong, and you should stop. You've done that before. How'd it go? Probably just like Elijah most of the time. We have good intentions and we have this desire in this heart that says maybe when I point out their sin and I call them out and I tell them to, to have some integrity about their faith and I'm going to call out their sin and tell them to change and stop what they're doing and I hope they'll listen and I hope they'll respond to it in a positive way. But that's not how Ahabs do. Ahabs get mad at you for pointing out their sin. And that's exactly what Ahab did to Elijah. He's like, Who, how dare you point out my sin? And so instead of changing, Ahab got mad at Elijah. And you know what he did? When things started going bad in Elijah's life, or Ahab's life, when things started going bad in Ahab's life, instead of realizing like a light bulb going off in his mind, being like, oh, this is probably happening because I'm willfully sinning and not changing. I probably should stop and change. Instead of doing that, you know what Ahab did? He started blaming Elijah for all of his problems. It's not my fault that this is happening in my life and things are going bad. It's your fault. Because they don't want to take responsibility for their own actions, right? They always need somebody else to blame. It's your fault for calling it out. It's your fault for not being loving toward me. It's your fault for not being accommodating. It's your fault that all this bad stuff is happening in my life. It can never be for the fact that I'm sinning and there's consequences to those decisions. It can never be my fault. Because as long as it's someone else's fault, you don't have to change, right? You don't have to fix it. You can always blame somebody else. And so now Elijah's got to live with this. He did what God told him to do. God, I told him. I went and I confronted them with the sin and I, and I pointed it out and I encouraged them to change and I gave them a warning. But God, all they did was get mad at me and shun me and push me away and now they blame everything on me. Elijah's pretty normal of a guy. We felt exactly what Elijah has felt. And then right after that, God says, come on, Elijah. Here's where I want you to go. I want you to go to Kareth Ravine. I want you to go and I'm going to, I want you to spend a little time in the valley. We've all been spending a little time in the valley in our lives. We know what that's like. We know what it's like to be in that ravine. We know what it's like to be in that place where we feel alone and isolated. Like nobody is for us. Nobody's there with us. Nobody's supporting us. We, feel, we know what it's like to be in that place where it feels like God is, is cutting away things in our lives. That's what, that's what Kareth means. God placed him in the Kareth Ravine. It means the place of cutting away. And so there's a season in many of our lives, all of our lives at some point, where God puts us in this place of isolation where we may feel alone. But in that place of loneliness and isolation, God begins a season of cutting away things in our lives. Cutting away sin cutting away a personality, cutting away flaws of that personality, cutting away emotions that are not healthy, cutting away thoughts that are not right. He's, he's refining us in the season of cutting away. And he says, as long as you stay where I placed you, Elijah, I'll provide for you. Stay right there. And so Elijah was in this season of feeling alone and isolated. But here's the one thing that we have to understand about those seasons where you feel alone and you feel isolated and you feel in the valley and you feel like God is cutting away things in your life. Because usually when that's happening, it means that God is preparing you. 
It's not just a season of cutting away, it's a season of preparation. And how willing you are to be humble in that season of isolation and cutting away will determine the magnitude or how great God can use you. How are you dealing with having things cut away? That might be where you're at right now. Because that means God is getting you ready for something. God was getting Elijah ready for something. And he brought him out of that valley. He brought him out of that season of isolation and cutting away. And he says, Elijah. And Elijah comes out, and I'm sure he's ready. He says, God, I've been in the valley, and I've been patient, and I've allowed to cut away, and I've discovered some, some, some things about myself that I'm changing, and I feel better, and I feel more focused. I feel more confident in my obedience to you, God. I am ready. I'm ready to serve. I'm ready to do what you want me to do. I'm ready to go where you want me to go. I'm ready to be who you want me to be, God. What's next? Many of you are in that season. What's next? I'm ready, God. I've been waiting for a while. And God says, Elijah, I want you to go to Zarephath. <laughs> what? Now, hang on a minute, God. I know I told you that I would go where you want me to go. And I know I told you I would do what you want me to do and I would be who you want me to be. But hang on, I didn't, I didn't think it was going to be there. Okay, I didn't, I didn't think I was going to go there and I didn't think that you're going to want me to do that. So let's rewind this a little bit and let me say, God, I am willing to do whatever I want to do and as long as you put your stamp of approval on it, then I'll do it as long as I approve of it. Because that's what a lot of us do, right? God, I will serve you and I will do and be and go to wherever I want to go. And then you tell me that's where you want me to be. And he says, well, that's not how it works, Sam. You're obedient and then you do what I tell you to do. You don't get to call the shots. And see, with the thing with Zarephath, it's like, okay, hang on. I just stood and pronounced a drought and a curse and punishment upon the nation of Israel, Ahab and Jezebel. They don't like me, God. And you're sending me to Zarephath? Uh, that is where Jezebel's from. And you want me to go to like her hometown? Yeah. Of all the places, God, you want me to go there? Yeah. You said you'd go anywhere. You were ready. Well, yeah, you're right. But on top of that, you know what else is about Zarephath? Zarephath is where they build the statues for Baal worship. He's like, God, you're sending me right into the lion's den of Baal worship. They hate me. He says, I know. Let's see how much you're willing to obey me when it's not your idea and it's not what you want. Sounds pretty familiar, right? Elijah's pretty normal. Many of us turn down opportunities to serve God because it's not what we want, right? And we're waiting for God to obey us <laughs> and do what we need him to do. And God says, that's not the way I work. So Elijah responds. He says, all right, if that's where you want me to go and that's what you want me to do, I will be faithful because I promised you I would. He goes to Zarephath. He walks to the city. He's at the city gate. He, he um, notices this woman at the gate. He walks up to this woman. And he says, hey, can you get me a drink of water? She says, yes, I will. He says, and, and by the way, while you're at it, make me some bread. Okay, well, sir, um, I, don't, I don't have enough bread to make you because actually I just have a little handful of flour and just a few ounces of oil that I actually was planning to make me and my son some bread and, and then we were going to die because we have nothing. This is the last food we have and we have nothing else for us. And Elijah's will, well, listen, here's what you do. Because my God is faithful and my God is good and my God is a provider. Here's what you do. You take your last bread, your last flour and oil, make me some bread. And as long as you're faithful in that, here's what God promises to do for you and your son. That if you will be faithful and you will do what I'm asking you to do, then God will make sure that that jar of flour and that jar of oil will never run out until the rains come again. 
And so she said, okay. And it happens. And so miraculously, this jar of flour never goes empty. No matter how much they use it, this jar of oil never runs dry. No matter how much they use it, it's replenished every day. God is providing for this woman and her son and Elijah every single day. And imagine what that's like. Many of you have walked that road. You're like, God, I don't even know where it's coming from. I don't even know where this provision is. But it, just every day, it astounds me that every day what I need is there. And yet it never runs out, God. And that's such an incredible example of who you are that I will praise you every single day for your provision. The one thing about provision is you have to be in a place of obedience to receive God's provision. And some of you right now are like, God, where's the provision? Where's the provision? God, I need it. I need it. I need it. And he's like, you know what? You're not where I told you to be. You went where you wanted to go, and you're providing for yourself. But if you'll be in a place of obedience where I want you to be, that's where I'll provide, just like in the Kareth Ravine. So if you want the provision, you need to be in place of obedience in your life. And every day, they worship God, they praise God. God, I mean, imagine being Elijah and imagine being this woman and seeing how God is providing for the needs of their family every single day. It's easy to pray, praise God and speak well of him in a season of provision when all things are good in your life. And one of the things that we learn with Elijah that many of us get wrong about the Bible, it's like, God, I have been faithful. I went and did and become who you wanted me to be, and you're providing for us, God. You're good, and I'm praising you. We're very tempted to believe that, God, because of my faithfulness, my faithfulness and my obedience to God will make my life tragedy-proof. We think that, right? How could anything bad happened to me or my wife or my kids or my family because I'm loving God right now. I'm following God. I went where God told me to go. I did what God told me to do, and I was who God told me to be. So how could anything bad happen to me? Elijah and the widow would soon discover that, you know what? That's nowhere in the Bible. It's nowhere a part of God's plan or his word. It's a message straight from Satan. So here they are praising God for provision, praise and praise and praise and praise and praising. It's easy to praise God in a season when you got everything. And then what happens? The widow's son turns up sick. Hey, it's, a, it's fine. It's fine. It's no big deal. God is our provider. God has been good. We're just going to pray for this boy, and God's going to heal him. He's going to make him better. We're praying, we're praying he's not better, but it's fine. It's fine, he's still sick, but it's fine. God's going to show up anytime because you know why? Because I'm faithful and I'm obedient and I've done what God told me to do. So because of that, God's going to heal him. I just know it. I don't have to worry about it. My faith is strong. God's going to heal him. He keeps getting sick. It's fine anytime now, God. Come on. You know, I've been faithful. I've done what you, I've, I've done what you told me to do, so that means you've got to do this now, Right? It means, it means you're on the hook, God. You can't let me down because if you don't heal this boy, then I'm walking away. I'm done. I'm not going to believe you anymore because I did what you told me to do. And if you don't do what I want you to do, then we're going to call it quits. Heal him any time, God. He keeps getting worse and worse till he stops breathing and the little boy dies. What? But God, I was faithful. God, I was obedient. I did what you told me to do. And you didn't do this? See, it's easy to praise God in the time of provision. They're praising, they're praising. But the moment the situation turns and tragedy strikes, guess what? They're praising, all of a sudden, turns into questioning. Wait a minute, I had faith when you were giving me everything I needed. And now that something happens that I don't like, my praising now turns into questioning. And God says that wasn't the purpose of the provision. For you to take it for granted. The purpose of the provision in the good times is to inspire you and to build your faith to trust me and praise me through the tragedy and the bad times. And so now Elijah's like, God, what am I doing here? The woman looks at Elijah and he says, it's your fault. You're the one that's brought this curse upon my family and my son. If, I, if you hadn't have been here, my son would have never died. And Elijah's like, God, why is it always my fault? Why am I always to blame? Why does it always come down on me? Because God was preparing Elijah. Because he was where God wanted him to be, 
God was ready to use him. He picks up the little boy, goes upstairs, prays over the little boy. The boy's life comes back into him. He walks him down to the mama and says, here, your son is alive. And the mama looks at Elijah and says, well, now I believe. Now I believe that you are a man of God. Now I believe that everything that you've said about your God is true. And the one thing that I look at that, the fact that she says, now I believe. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. For, for, see, for a season, you've praised God for your provision. But you didn't really believe it. Because when times got hard, you stopped believing. So all that in the season of good was really nothing. Because the moment that things changed in your life, you stopped praising and you stopped believing. So did you really believe in the season of good? In the season of provision? Because if you believed then, then you would believe now. And she says, now I believe. Why did it take such a tragedy to get her to believe and to change that in her? Sometimes it takes that in our lives. When we look at this, now Elijah is like, okay, God, this is incredible. This is awesome. I, I went where you wanted me to go. I did what you wanted me to do. I've been in the valley. I've been in isolation. I've been shunned. But now I've come out and I've been obedient to you. And I've seen your provision. And I've seen you work through me. Let's do this. What else is next in my life, God? Now I'm ready. He says, I want you to go back to Ahab. Ahab? I've already talked to that guy. He hates me. He's not going to listen to a word I say. You want me to go back to him and talk to him again about his sin? And what he's doing wrong? Yes. Have you ever been in that situation? You're like, God, I don't want to go talk to them again. They're going to hate me. They already hate me. They're not going to listen to me. I want you to go back and talk to them. They're going to bl- they already blame me for everything, God. It's all right. Go and confront them again. So Elijah's, okay, I'll do it. It's going to be hard. I imagine all the things running through Elijah's head as he's walking to approach Ahab. Elijah don't even say a word. He don't even get anything out of his mouth. He's walking up to Ahab, and Ahab is like, there's the troubler of Israel. You know what that means? He's like, he said, there is the guy who is at fault for all of our problems, right there. There's the troublemaker. If it wasn't for you, none of this would be happening in my life right now. Of course, it could not be the fact that that he sins and disobeys God. Can't be a part of it. It's got to be somebody else's fault. And so Elijah's like, okay, listen. Let's, all right, let's just, let's put this to an end. How about this? You worship Baal, I worship God, Jehovah. Let's just call it quits and let's have a showdown. I'm going to meet you up on top of Mount Carmel. He said, and we're going to find out whose God is real God. He said, sure, all right. He said, you bring all your prophets that you want to bring of Baal up on top of this mountain. You make an altar, I'll make an altar, and whoever prays and their God sends fire out of heaven to consume and burn up the altar, then that's the true God. Ahab says, agree, deal. So they do it. And Andy talked about that last week. We know that they made their sacrifice and sang and danced and cut themselves, nothing. Elijah prays. He says, God, I want you to reveal yourself. I want you to show them who you are. I want them to see your power. Reveal yourself to them, God. And he prays. Fire comes out of heaven, consumes that altar. Can you imagine the relief on Elijah? You did it, God. I trusted, I believed, I was obedient, and your word was true. Elijah knows for three and a half years now, God, I spoke up and I believed in something that you told me was true. I've been in the valley. I've experienced tragedy. I've walked some difficult roads. I've seen you move and work in some incredible ways, God. For three and a half years, I've been waiting this drought out. I've been waiting this dry season in my life out. And I believe in this moment, God, that you're getting ready to fulfill your word and to pour out your blessing. And so Elijah says, I'm not coming off this mountain. 
until it rains. I believe that, that God's word is going to come to fruition. Many of you are in a season of drought and a dry season in your life where you've been in a wilderness, you've been in the valley, you've seen God do some things, but you're still trusting in that promise that God gave you months or years ago. And Elijah's on the mountain and he says, listen, I know it's happening. I know it's coming to fruition. I know it's coming true. And he tells his servant, he says, hey, go and check the horizon of the sea and see if there's a cloud, rain clouds rising. Servant goes and looks, comes back, nothing, nothing. He says, go again. Goes back second time, nothing. Third time, nothing. Fourth time, nothing. Fifth time, nothing. Sixth time, nothing. I'm sure the this, this servant is kind of getting tired of this. Seventh time, he says, go back again. I know it's happening. So the servant goes and he looks and he's probably kind of put off at this time, I would think, and he's kind of nonchalantly just giving it just a little bit of uh, lip service, looks over the sea, he's like, whatever, I don't, and then, wait a minute. I've done this seven times. There's nothing there. But this time, the servant says, wait a minute. He, he looks a little closer and he sees a tiny, small cloud starting to come up over the horizon of the sea. He said, it wasn't there before. And he goes back and to Elijah, and Elijah's still praying. And he says, Elijah, I don't know, but this time I saw this tiny, small cloud way out on the horizon of the sea. And Elijah knew in his heart, in his soul, this is it. This is the promise. God's word is coming true right now. And he goes ahead, and because he believed in the promise, he said, go ahead and tell um, Ahab. He said, Ahab, you better hitch up your chariots and get off the mountain because it's about to come a flood. The storm clouds hadn't even rose yet, but he knew it was coming. He could feel it. And as he stood there on top of that mountain, the skies began to get cloudy. They began to grow dark. It says the wind picked up. As Elijah standing on top of that mountain, I can see his robe just flapping in the breeze of those storm clouds. He could hear the, the roar and the roll of that thunder across the horizon. Can you imagine what he was feeling inside? Three and a half years! He had believed in this promise and had waited for it. And finally, his faithfulness and his patience was becoming reality. And as those clouds rolled in and the skies grew dark and Ahab and his chariots were headed down the mountain, the skies that are full of blessing and rain open up and just start pouring out the rain. This is what he'd been waiting for. Imagine just standing in the rain in a storm cloud as God is pouring out that blessing. Finally. You know the feeling when you believed in something and trusted in something and God finally brought it to reality in your life, what that would feel like, this was that moment for Elijah. Many of you have, have experienced that and many of you are waiting on that moment right now. And Elijah, it says that the power of God came up over. I can only imagine the power of God in that moment. He lifted up his, his robe and he tucked it in his belt. And it says the power of God came over Elijah and he took off running. It says the power of God was so strong on Elijah that he beat the chariots to Jezreel. And imagine that journey of running in the rain. Thinking about every step of his journey over the last three and a, three and a half years. God, I was faithful there. I was faithful then. God, I was faithful then. God, it was really hard. I lived in the crack. I lived in the ravine. I lived in the valley. I faced that tragedy. But God, I remained faithful through it all. And you did it, God. How powerful. This was it, right? Imagine he gets to Jezreel. He, whew, that burden is lifted off the shoulders of Elijah. And he goes to bed. He gets up the next morning. If I was Elijah, I would be anticipating such good news. I can't wait to hear this morning because I'm sure that, that Ahab and Jezebel has seen the power of God displayed in their life. And that was the straw that would break the camel's back. And because God has revealed himself this way, they're going to turn their life around. They're going to tear down those Baal worship and those idols. And they're going to recommit their life to God. 
I'm just waiting to hear it, God. This is what my journey has been for. And the first thing he hears in the morning is, Elijah, you better get out of here because you've ticked off Jezebel. Instead of changing, she said, by evening time, she's going to hunt you down and kill you, just like how her prophets were killed. This is that, what in the world, God, are you doing right now? This was supposed to be that, that high moment, God. But it wasn't. And so, Elijah was discouraged. God told him to be in Jezreel, but because of his discouragement, Elijah didn't want to stay where God wanted him to be any longer. Like us, right? When we get discouraged, we don't want to stay where God has placed us and wait on what is next. He took it into his own hands and he left where God wanted him to be. And he took off running. And he came to a broom tree. He left his servant and went another day's travel, sat under a broom tree. And he said, God, I've had enough. I've had enough. I don't want to serve you no more. I want to die. I don't want to live no more, God. I'm no better than the servants of my ancestors. I'm done. How many of you this morning are exactly in that place or have been there where you said, you know what, God, I don't understand this. I don't understand it because every time I do what you want me to do and I serve and I am faithful and I try to be obedient to you, God, it seems like my life gets worse and worse the more I serve you. And it's so stressful and I'm tired of it. I don't want to face these battles no more. Why can't my life get easier the more I serve you, God? But it seems to me that every time I try to be obedient, things bad happen in my life over and over and over. And I'm done. I'm not doing it no more. I'm not. I'm not going to serve no more. I'm not even going to go to church no more. I'm not going to pray no more. I'm not going to read my Bible no more because it's all a waste. I thought doing all this is to make my life easy and make it better so I don't have to deal with the heartache. But every time I do this, people get mad at me, shun me, push me away, or I have to deal with a problem. Many of you have walked away. You're just, you're just here but just because you're going through the motion. You're just doing it because you know you're supposed to. But in reality, you don't really pray. You don't really read your Bible. You don't serve God. You don't really do anything. You're just like a zombie going through the motions of your faith because you realize, God, every time I try to do something, it gets bad. And I'm not going to do it no more. Maybe God is saying, your dry season is almost over. Your promise is about to come true. And so an angel appears to Elijah and he brings food and a drink on a rock and he wakes up and he says eat and drink Elijah and he eats and drinks falls asleep gets up again provides food he says you're going to need to eat and drink Elijah because the journey that I have for you is going to be long it's going to be hard and you don't have the strength to do it on your own so replenish yourself he said what I want you to do is I want you to meet me on the mountain I'll be waiting for you and so that journey of meeting God on the mountain took about 40 days in the wilderness as Elijah wandered through the wilderness, contemplating everything that had gone on, allowing all of his discouragement to blind him from what God was to really do. Just like many of you right now, your discouragement has blinded you from truly seeing what God is doing for you. And Elijah travels to the mountains gets up there on the cave and he goes in the cave and God says Elijah what are you doing why are you here Elijah and maybe God is telling you that this what are you doing here why did you come here this morning did you come with an expectation did you come expecting to hear a word from God or are you just going through the motions as Elijah sits in that cave, 
there was a windstorm that kicked up on that mountain. It was just so powerful that it was crushing the rocks on the mountain. Then there was an earthquake, and then there was a fire, and then there was an earthquake. And God said, Elijah, I'm not in the earthquake. I'm not in the earthquake. I'm not in the, I'm not in the earthquake. I'm not in the fire. Because Elijah, like many of you, were searching to find God in some huge, miraculous occurrence. And because you didn't see him in the miraculous occurrence, you disqualified him as being God. And Elijah says, I need you to be quiet, Elijah, and I need you to be patient, and I need you to sit there, and I need you to listen. Because when you get quiet and you listen, you will hear my voice. Why are you here, Elijah? Because I'm waiting on you, God. Many of you are waiting that message that God has for you. It says, and then a small, gentle whisper came through the mountain. And Elijah knew that was God. And he says he stepped out onto the mountain and covered his face in his cloak. And God said, Elijah, what are you doing? He said, I'm ready to listen. Here's the thing. Here's the thing about, here's the thing about Elijah. He allowed all of his discouragement to blind him from the true reality of what God had done for him. And when he got still to listen, because all that Elijah said is, God, I'm the only one. There's nobody like me, nobody that loves God, nobody that wants to serve God anymore. I'm by myself. And he says, no, you've allowed your discouragement to blind you to the reality of what I've been doing. He says, actually, Elijah, there's a hundred other prophets ready to serve alongside of you. He says, also, there's 7,000 other followers of Christ who have not bowed their knee to Baal, who is ready to follow you because of the influence that you have, Elijah. But you couldn't see that because you got all wrapped up into yourself and your own discouragement. I need you to see what I've been doing for you, Elijah. Many of you are missing what God has been doing through you because you're so wrapped up into your own discouragement and frustration. That you're ready to give up serving God, but God says, listen, Elijah, you're not done until I tell you you're done. And I've got more things planned for you, Elijah. I just need you to get alone with me for a minute and understand why are you here. Ask yourself that same question. Why are you here? What does God want? Maybe it is the dry season for you is over. The drought is in. The wilderness wandering is over. Position yourself to receive the blessing of God that He has. Let us see. God, we just want to stand in your presence this morning and praise you for your goodness. Lord, we believe that for many of us, this previous year has been a dry season, has been a drought. But Lord, we're planning in promises and believing in your promise in our lives that this new year is going to bring new blessings. Lord, that our wilderness and our dry season is over. We're going to stand and position ourselves to receive the promise of blessing you have given us. Lord, help us to spend that moment listening to your voice in the quietness of our hearts to understand your plan. Lord, we love you, Jesus. We just ask you to come. Right now. Thank you, pray. Let us just worship you this morning, church.
great anticipation we await the promise to come everything that you have spoken will come to pass come on sing it out let it be done Receive your rain. We 